Sit back, relax, and take a ride with us on the Gun Blog Variety Cast, Episode 3. Welcome back to the Gun Blog Variety Cast. I'm your host, Sean, from NC Gun Blog, and with me today is Adam from Guns, Cars, Tech Blog. How are you doing, Adam? I'm doing great. How are you doing today, Sean? Oh, doing pretty good. I'm stuck in a hotel in Wilmington, but we're still bringing you the podcast. Nice, nice. That's dedication right there. Yeah, it's sanity. i got to do something to <laughs> maintain my sanity. All right, well, let's get started with our usual tactical dog and fitness report. What's going on with you? My, my dog, you know, we talked about her being a cat. Well, yeah. uh, she's actually now a kind of a fat cat. A fat cat. Yeah. We had this problem a couple of years ago where uh, my dog, so the Belgian Malinois is supposed to weigh between about 60 and 75 pounds if they're female, um, 70 to to 80 pounds if they're male. Uh, My dog, which is a female, uh, weighed 97 pounds a couple of years ago. Yeah. So um, uh, (laughs) we took her into the vet um, for her yearly and the vet came in and said, oh, you poor fat baby. Uh, and so we were given an option of uh, cutting back her food or hip surgery. So uh, we chose the cutting back of the food. Um, probably about uh, six months ago, we kind of loosened up on that. And uh, she was down to, uh, to 62 pounds, exactly where she needed to be. But this last weekend, uh, she was sitting. So my wife was in the kitchen and had, I don't know, something in her hand. And so the dog sits when she's begging, right? She's like, she just sits there. And uh, I noticed the the rolls of fat going over her hips when she was sitting there. And I was like, oh, this is a problem. And then my wife was like, oh, no, 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 no. She's she's fine. She's fine. Uh, But we'll go and wear when we take her to the pet store store tomorrow. So, okay. So I go in and take her to the pet store, 82 pounds. Okay. Yeah, that's... Fat baby. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I have the opposite problem. My dog doesn't eat enough. So we're we're constantly trying to get food into her to keep her up to sixty six pounds. So we feed her a canna, which is uh like origin. It's made by the same people. I don't know if uh-huh. so my wife makes fun of me because I feed the dog hippie food. Because it's all oh. like <laughs> it's all like fancy stuff. It's like it's like eighty dollars for a twenty dollar bag or a twenty wow, pound geez. bag. Yeah, it's not cheap. My wife is a former vet tech, so she handles oh. all those sort of things. Okay. And my wife doesn't use the doesn't use the uh, the scale to determine if the dog is fat. She's got that whole feel the ribs and feel the bones and say, yeah, that's about right. Yeah. So whatever she says goes on that one. Plus, right. this dog, unlike the previous dog, which would eat anything that possibly could be eaten. Um, and then lay there and do nothing all day. This one is like, run, 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 run. Eh, maybe I'll eat if I feel like it <laughs> sooner or later. But she's still young though, right? She's like uh, 18 yeah, months. She's, she's 18 months old. Yeah. So she's still growing. So I'm stuck in a hotel room in Wilmington, Wilmington, North Carolina, not Wilmington, Delaware. Um, we won't talk about why, but it's to do with my job. It's not so, uh, I should say that, uh, my, I don't advertise what I do for a living, not because it's any kind of secret, but because I wish to keep a, some sort of separation between my political life and my work life. So they've sent me down here to do my job. Yay. And the reason I'm talking about it on the podcast is that you're not going to hear this podcast before I'm home. So um, I'm fairly careful not to tell everybody that I'm not in my house at the time. So, Always a good plan. I, I We all can't be in the position that JG was in with, you know, former police officer father lived right next door. Yeah. <laughs> so he could watch the house. He's like, I'm going on vacation. Don't try <laughs> to rob anything because my dad lives next door. Former cop, he'll shoot you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, so my doing fitnessy things apparently this week involves walking across the street to um, Texas Roadhouse. Oh, yeah. That's my fitness. Right. But I'm not eating any carbs with that. So that, that should help. That That's good. That's good. Because they did come back and say that carbs are now bad for you again. I I think. I don't know. Yeah. I can't keep I up. think it's the being fat part that's bad for me. I don't know if yeah. it has anything to do with the carbs or not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the carbs will make you fat. That's what I'm told. Yeah. 
before I left, since you know Monday was a day off, and I was I was pretty wiped out at the end of the last week. Um, hadn't hadn't got enough sleep, and so I took Friday off instead of riding my bike on Friday, which is usually a actually no, it's Thursday. I took off. Um, Friday is normally off. I didn't ride Friday. I was going Saturday is my normal long ride day, and I took that day off too. So I had a lot of days off. I took my bike in and got a new bicycle chain, new rear um, rear cassette. And Sunday I went cassette out and like I rode tape? my. Yeah, that's what they call the gears in the back. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Uh, on Sunday, I rode my 100k, 62.37 miles, and with the new chain and apparently you know all that rest. And my brain falling out in the first three miles of the ride, I decided I was going to ride it really hard. So I went out. Normally I'm riding with the old chain and not pushing too hard. I'm riding about 14, 13, 7 for the miles per hour for the whole route. 15.1. That's a like that's like a 20 percent. Yeah, that's a lot. The first. Well, yeah. And then the first two um, the first two hours of the ride, I rode 16 miles an hour. Yeah, that's significantly more. Now, see, I'm not a, uh, a bicycle rider, so that's, you know, 16 miles an hour. That's that's pretty pretty slow for my truck. It does seem it seems kind of slow, but it's not when you're pushing them pedals. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I went out and smoked it. I did 62.37 miles, and it was like four hours and eight minutes and some odd seconds, and that included the stops in the middle and any, you know, peeing on a tree that I happened to do along the way, and the times I got off the bike and stretched because my feet were burning or my knees were hurting. I think that should have been a sign, maybe. No, that happens. No? Okay. Feet burn every once in a while anyway. Okay. But, yeah, I got back, and I'm like, I'm slaughtered. This is just, I, I was a mess. So, of course, I had to ride my second ride for the weekend. I did that on Monday, and I'm like, I'm going to ride this nice and calm. I rode a 25-mile ride because uh, I'm building up the second day. You know, I'm doing the long ride, and then I'm doing slightly more and more and more for the second day. So I can do two long rides in a row. I'm working up to where I'm doing 62 one day and, like, 50 the next. Hmm. And I did 25 miles. I'd, I got up to 25 miles this weekend. And I took it easy. I, I didn't push really hard. And I still rode that at 14.16 miles per hour. The fastest I have ever ridden that 25 mile course. And that's all down to the chain. And I didn't, I couldn't develop full power. I was, I was, my legs were just smoked from the day before and I was still riding faster. So So, that chain made a big deal. So how does a chain make you go faster? I don't, I don't get that. Are you got some sort of an engineering background, right? Yeah, a little bit little bit can you pick you can picture the the front chain ring on a bicycle and how the chain comes into the top and yes you turn the chain ring okay now i want you to imagine uh the chain links themselves they can they wear Uh, yes the chain everybody says the chain stretches the chain doesn't actually stretch what happens is is the pins that hold the links together wear and that means that they um that the send the the pins become farther apart because the parts where they rub get smaller Okay. Can you picture picture that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what happens is instead of mating up to that chain ring exactly like it's supposed to, it's long and then the top of the chain point, the ring point, hits that chain and has to drag it down. So you've got this chain instead of just mating up and then driving, it's having to slide for the first third or so of that chain ring it's sliding across the chain ring Mm. all that friction in the chain is just totally wasted energy i wouldn't have thought it was that much but still you know i'm i'm riding a mile per hour faster just on a chain change yeah it's significant huh wouldn't have thought it was that much yeah and it was a hundred dollars to get it fixed so so do your sprockets wear too well because my chain was so wiped out the guy said that means your cassette is messed up so your cassette has to be replaced so i had to change the chain i had to change the cassette in the back but he took a look at the chain rings and he said they're fine but they're made out of a much tougher material than the 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 cassette in the back okay so interesting but i miss my dog i haven't seen her since yeah monday they're so cute well saturday tuesday morning all right, so let's go to Blue Collar Prepping with that bratty kid sister of the gun blogosphere, Aaron. Well, hey, Aaron, how's it going? It's going fine, Sean. How are things with you? I'm doing pretty well, but 
I was uh, watching TV and I caught a little section of this Doomsday Preppers thing. And I got a question for you, Aaron. Can you send me all your money so I can prep like those guys? Because there's no way I can afford that. Uh, sure. I, I will send you all of my zero money. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, gee. how can you prep if you don't have that much money? What can I do for just a little bit? Well, there's a surprising amount you can do with just a little bit as opposed to Doomsday Preppers where there was a guy who had a he had a fortress and he spent like 7 million dollars on it, which is just ridiculous. Is is but, there a podcast version of the facepalm? Cuz that's what I'm doing right now. Yeah, quite so. Quite so. Um which is especially funny since this was supposed to be the back to basics season. I'm sorry, but, what? Uh, yeah, I know. That was my <laughs> reaction as well. Well, I mean, you know, building a castle, that's pretty basic. Just pile a bunch of rocks on top of each other. They actually had a show about that. I'm, I'm not kidding. It was called Doomsday Castle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, anyone can have impressive preps if they have the kind of money the government has to throw at a problem. But for those of us who can only prep on an allowance of $20 a month... Things have to get a little bit more creative, and that's why today I'm going to talk about another low-tech prep that anyone can afford, and most folks probably already have in their pantry, and that's trash bags. Trash bags? Trash bags? Trash bags, absolutely. What am I going to do with a bunch of trash bags? I'm going to take out my trash? You can do a lot of things with trash bags, Sean. Uh, After all, they are waterproof, they're tear-resistant, they come in a variety of colors, and if you get spendy, some of them even have drawstrings. Now, if you think about it, you can do a lot with something that has these qualities. I mean, okay, it's it's waterproof, right? So you can use it as a rain catch or a water carrier if you're caught out in the wilderness. If it's a dark color, you can use it to make a solar still, which is a kind of way to distill water from plants, from brackish water you can't drink, from your own urine if you're deep into Bear Grylls territory. Uh, there are going to be instructions on what a solar still is and how to use it in the podcast notes. If, it's, if it, the trash bag is a light color, you can use the contrast as a rescue signal or when you're walking uh, down the road at night so that cars don't run into you and hit you. You can use it as an improvised shelter. You can put it overhead to waterproof a lean-to you can put it on the ground to keep your sleeping bag dry. If you carry two, you can do both. And and why not? Because trash bags are, they're not completely weightless, but they're only a few ounces. Yeah, and they're not very expensive. Not at all. Not at all. And if you've got a knife with you, and you really should, there are a lot more things you can do with it. You can cut a hole for your head and arms if you're so inclined, and you've got a waterproof poncho. If it's cold and you're caught outside without a proper jacket, you can put it on underneath your clothes so it, so that it will trap that layer of warm air right up against your skin. It won't be comfortable, but it'll keep you from going hypothermic. Yeah, and having had hypothermia, you don't want hypothermia. Oh, it's not Take fun. the uncomfortable plastic bag. Yeah, and one of the best things is that these trash bags, they come in different sizes. Um, most people, your average 30 gallon yard trash bag will, will cover them. But if you're extra fluffy, you can get contractor grade bags that go up to at least 55 gallons because they're what you use to line the drums with. Mm-hmm. Interesting. There are other things you can do with it. If you've got the smaller ones, you can use it to wrap your feet so that if, uh, if you've got a hole in your shoe, that way your feet don't get wet. Everyone knows that a wet, cold foot really sucks, especially if you have to do a lot of hiking. You can cut it into strips if you need cordage. You can do just a whole bunch of other things with it, and as a last resort, you can even use it to hold your garbage. Well, that is also important. Yeah. (laughs) I really like this list because it's it's so obvious once you think about it, but it's not obvious unless you think about it. You know? Well, thank you. Yeah. (laughs) One of the things I like about this series, uh, Aaron, is that what you're telling us is stop being caught up in the idea that you need to spend money to buy a specialized piece of kit in order to do a certain job when you can take some pretty obvious things around the house and you can do multiple different things. Perhaps 
not well enough that you'd be willing to hike across the Sahara Desert this way, but enough to keep you alive in a, in a, for a few days in a bad situation, the sort of situation that you or I or, or any of our listeners might get themselves into. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm totally tomorrow grabbing the 42-gallon contractor bags I've got in my shed and throwing them in my truck. There you go. Well, Aaron, where can we get some more information on things like this? Well, Sean, if anyone wants more tips on how to prep on a budget, they should visit bluecollarprepping.blogspot.com, where we've got new articles five days a week. Excellent. Thank you very much, Aaron. My pleasure. Take care. Well, Adam, trash bags. Who would have thought? I know, right? That's uh, but that that's a great tip, and that's why we have that segment. It's awesome. All right, well, let's go to felons behaving badly. What you got? Oh, you're going to love this one. Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department is investigating a homicide at the thousand block of Coliseum Drive. This is uh, dated August 25th, 2014. Police received a call for service at 8.45 a.m. in response to a fight. When officers arrived, they found a man suffering from gunshot wounds. He was transported to Carolina's Medical Center, where he was pronounced dead by medical personnel. The victim has been identified as Victim 26. His family has been notified of his death. Police arrested Suspect 20 for the murder of Victim. They also charged him with firearm by felon. I, I'm assuming that no. they meant his possession of a firearm by a felon. So, okay, so he's 20, and he's got a, I'm assuming a pistol, and he was already a felon. Yeah. Okay. Police Just. think that the suspect and victim were involved in a domestic dispute that led to the shooting. You know, we always hear about all these domestic violence murders, domestic violence murders. Who's, who's domestically violent and murdering each other? We've got the suspect, who we already know is a felon, but... See, it's not just that he's a felon. It gets worse from there. Okay. He was convicted of assault with a deadly weapon inflicting serious injury 4-29-2014. So less than four months before he was accused of murdering somebody, he was convicted of assault with a deadly weapon inflicting serious injury. And how much time did he spend in prison? Uh... Clearly not Obviously enough. None. <laughs> he was given apparently he was given probation, suspended sentence, and special probation, split probation. Uh-huh. Typically, what they, that means is they give you some time in jail and some time on probation. And my suspicion is is he spent a little bit of time in prison or in jail, awaiting trial because he was his offense date was a little over a year ago, seven four two thousand thirteen. So he probably spent a little bit of time in jail then. This year in April, the end of April, almost May, he got convicted, and then they turned him loose. Where All right. he could have, you know, assault with a deadly weapon, inflicting a serious injury, class E felony. Clearly, all that time in jail, he he learned his lesson there. Yeah, right? must have. Well, he learned a lesson. Yeah, he learned something. <laughs> Speeding to elude arrest or attempted conspiracy, so uh, he got it. That was also on there. So. Consolidated for judgment, like it's my favorite word in the whole world, my favorite legal phrase, consolidated for judgment. That's like your two for one deal. So that means we're going to throw the book at you, but then we're not actually going to make you serve all that stuff? Apparently. Uh, That's awesome. I don't know. And not to leave out the victim, the victim, not a felon, but he has been convicted back in 2001 of communicating threats, class one misdemeanor. Oh, so this like this guy liked to to threaten that he was gonna hurt somebody. Apparently, yeah. maybe he stopped. I mean, it yeah. has been thirteen years. Oh, oh wait, no, oh, that's the funny part. Look, oh, that's crazy. I didn't even see that before. His offense date is listed as January one two thousand and one, but the conviction date is listed as twelve eight two thousand nine. So I'm guessing that there's some sort of a offense date mistake because I, I can't imagine that a class one misdemeanor has a uh, you know can can sit for almost nine years before they convict him yeah i think i think here in tennessee if you go for more than a year um they can't even arrest you for a misdemeanor right so he was he was uh convicted in 2009 yeah of communicating threats okay so so six five five years well you know maybe he learned his lesson maybe on that one stopped maybe. And stopped uh, threatening people so that was when he was 21 that 2001 date that couldn't have yeah, yeah. 2001 yeah. doesn't make yeah. sense that doesn't make sense we always hear about these domestic violence murders. This was a clearly it's a, it's a domestic violence situation is what they're saying, and it's going to get listed as a domestic violence murder when the when the statistics come out, and all of the people who hate guns are going to oh you're killing your wives with your guns and what is it? It's two guys getting in a fight probably over some woman, 
Baby mama. One of them a felon in possession of a firearm or somebody else. So clearly, this is your and my fault. Yeah, and uh, it's also going to get chalked up to, uh, hey, you know, most killers and victims know each other. Yeah, they definitely knew each other. Yeah. Our next section is uh, Nikki Kenyon, Foreign Policy for Grownups, but our foreign policy correspondent, Nikki Kenyon, is away on assignment and will return in a few weeks. So let's go straight into strange North Carolina and Tennessee gun laws. Do you want to go first or should I go first? You go first. All right. We talked a little bit about this on our first episode, how North Carolina's concealed weapons law, um, fairly broad, but the concealed handgun permit is clearly a concealed handgun permit. It doesn't apply to anything else. Our concealed weapons law says it shall be unlawful for any person to willfully and intentionally carry concealed about his person any Bowie knife, or is that Bowie knife? Dirk, dagger, slung shot, loaded cane, metallic knuckles, razor, shuriken, stun gun, or other deadly weapon of like kind, except when the person is on his own premises. And there are exceptions. It shall be unlawful any person to willfully and intentionally carry to conceal about his person any pistol or gun, except in the following circumstances. The person is on his own premises, or two, the deadly weapon is a handgun, the person has a concealed weapons permit, concealed handgun permit, yada, 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 or is a military permittee or a law enforcement under various sections of the law. What that says is, I've got a concealed handgun permit. I can carry a concealed handgun in any place that isn't posted and or is not illegal under law. Right, right, right. But what I can't do is carry a fixed blade knife concealed. Uh, what about the Sikhs? Well, no, they're not. They're open carried, so it's cool. Oh, okay. I can totally. I can take. I could take a claymore and strap it across my uh, the <laughs> sword claymore and strap it across my back and wander around. Nobody could say anything because it's not concealed. Oh, interesting. Right, my favorite. Slungshot. Do you ever wonder yeah. if maybe like spelled it wrong? They mean slingshot. I found out actually. I found out what it is. Do you, you, do you, did you ever have you ever heard of slungshot before? No, no. I thought I thought it was a, a, a typo as well. Nope, it's not. And 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 if you ever look in your uh, your state's law and see slungshot, and people tell you that means you can't carry a slingshot, that's not true. It's totally different. Slungshot is a uh, an old sailor's weapon. Um, it's not originally a weapon. You ever seen? Uh, you know what a shot line is? Uh, in the Navy? Mm, explain it to me. Okay, have you ever seen when two ships come close to each other and they want to get a line to each other? Yes. You'll see the guy with an M14 rifle and a big, looks like a, um, a grenade launcher at the end. Yes, that's what I was it, thinking you were thinking of. Right. It's got a ball in it with a rope, that tra- a piece of twine that trails behind it. Right. Right. That's the new high-tech version. The old low-tech version was you carried two loops of, of rope. You tied a monkey's fist to the end of one of the ropes. You spun it and chucked it at them, and hopefully it got there, and they'd catch it and pull your rope across. Huh. Well, if you take that monkey's fist or a piece of wood is another way they would do it so it would float and cut off about six feet of rope. Oh, should I say line because we're talking about the Navy? Right. Now what you've got is a chunk of weight of some kind at the end of a rope, huh. which That's if slung you shot? swing it, it beats the crap out of whoever you're hitting. Well, other deadly weapon of like kind means sand in a sock is the same thing. Really? A bar of soap wrapped in a towel really? is the same exact thing as a piece of as a piece of rope and a weight on the end, which is what slung shot is. Now, I don't know too many people who carry slung shot, whether or not it's even concealed, right? Because it's not illegal to carry it. If you tie it in a loop and sling it around your neck, it's not concealed. It's not a crime. But you can't put it in your pocket so nobody can see it. Nor can you take a sock, fill it full of sand, and hide it inside your jacket. Or take, you know, a bar of soap, wrap it in a towel, and hide that inside your coat. Huh. Interesting. But I can carry a gun, but I can't carry any of these other things. Yeah. Stun guns. That's the other one. Stun gun. If you are in North Carolina and you're thinking, oh, I don't want to carry a gun, but I want to carry an electric shock device, you know, not a taser, but just a stun gun. Right. Not only can't you carry it concealed, you can't carry it concealed even if you have a concealed handgun permit. It's against the law. Huh. So I think one of the things that we need to do in this state is we need to get the changed. So the section two, the deadly weapon is a handgun. The person has a concealed handgun permit. It really should say 
it really should say the exceptions to the the general rule are if you have a concealed weapons permit or concealed handgun permit you can carry any of these things because quite frankly if you're carrying a gun do i really carry do you really care that you've got a set of brass knuckles no not really no not not really yeah one of the things that i did is i uh researched it and i read it and i thought about it I carried, before they allowed us to carry handguns in restaurants that served alcohol, I had to leave my firearm outside, so I got myself a leather sap. Oh, I think I remember this. There's a guy in town uh, in Raleigh who makes them. Uh, hmm. I think I'll put that in the show notes. If you want a, a really nice leather sap made handmade by, by a really nice guy, um, check him out. Um, I'll leave that in the show notes. Um, so he made me a copy of this uh, leather sap that's commercially available. The commercially available one is a solid chunk of lead with a metallic, flat metallic spring. So it's a flat sap, it's not a blackjack. Blackjacks are round, they have a spring inside them. If you hit somebody with a blackjack, you're gonna break a bone or cave their skull in. Oh. Saps, on the other hand, don't necessarily kill people. (laughs) (laughs) I have a blackjack too, but. Oh, well, all right. Apply to Michael Z. Williamson. If you're Facebook friends with Michael Z. Williamson, ask him if he's got any of those blackjacks. They're great. Um, just don't hit anybody <laughs> in any situation where it wouldn't be legal to shoot them. <laughs> so what have you got, Adam? I've got it's kind of like a, like an interesting thing. Uh, it's um, So this all came out because of a recent case involving everyone's favorite gun troll here in Tennessee, Leonard Embody. Leonard Embody came to prominence here in uh, a couple of years ago, I think 2009, 2010, because uh, he was uh, uh, walking through a park wearing um, BDUs while carrying a front-slung AK. We, we talked about that. It was an AK pistol. Last year, back in uh, July of 2013, it's, it's now uh, September of 2014, He decided that he was going to now at this point, he'd already had his um, his handgun carry permit revoked for uh, his antics, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, And so he uh, made a case out of Kydex for his uh, AR-15. And. On the end of his AR-15, he had a suppressor. Um, well, he, you know, the way that he made this Kydex case, it was, you know, basically, you could tell exactly what was in the case, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it was like a, you know, like a vacuum formed um, case for this thing. So he, so he uh, slaps that thing on his back, and then he uh, walks up and down uh, the street here in Nashville, uh, which is the capital. In between the Supreme Court and uh, the state legislature, mm-hmm. just walking up and down the street, doesn't have does just you know, hey look at me, I'm just a guy walking up and down the street. Oh, and uh, I forgot to mention he was also wearing wearing a uh, plate carrier with uh, with armor in it, the rifle grade body armor. Yes, yes. All right. So I'm guessing that this didn't phase the police at all they're totally used to that in nashville right they they actually some of them know who he is um and some of them are not to at this point well yeah so so they stopped him and they um they were asking him something i i don't remember what uh he's got he's got the whole thing up on on youtube but um so and this is all just just kind of background but they let him go uh and then there was a supervisor or a sergeant uh, that came by um, because he he was they were getting called they you know were getting calls hey there's this guy with a rifle you know walking around downtown what's you know what's going on well this uh, this sergeant goes hey um so my training and experience you know those are magic words for a police officer my training and experience says that that thing might have a suppressor on it and in Tennessee it is illegal to own a suppressor so in tennessee you can't own a suppressor unless you've paid the federal tax and retained the paperwork okay that's that's the that's the language um is that you have to have retained the paperwork so this officer uh this sergeant asks uh, mr embody hey so uh i see that you may have a suppressor there do you have have you paid the tax silence 
uh, okay, so um, I really need to know that you have, have paid the tax and retained the paperwork. Well, you're not allowed to ask me that. Anyway, there, there, was, this, there was this whole long thing. Um, he ended up getting arrested for illegal possession of a suppressor. Mm-hmm. Um, and I posted about this the day after it happened or, or something like that because he was, at the time, uh, he was uh, an FFL and had his SOT, so he was actually a suppressor dealer. So I knew that he had that suppressor legally. So, and what I said in, in that post was basically, okay, all he has to do is prove that he has retained the paperwork, and then you know they'll drop the charges. Mm-hmm. Well, he kind of got in my comment section uh, and was like, "They're not allowed to ask me that. You know, they're not allowed to to." Uh, to see the paperwork, blah, 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 blah. And so I kept asking him, okay, well, if you don't show them the paperwork, then how do you prove that you've retained the paperwork? Well, they're not allowed to ask me that. Okay, sure, whatever. It was probably, a, I would imagine, a very bad 14 months for him. But on August 26th, 14, 13 months after his original arrest, the charges were dropped because there is no requirement to actually show the paperwork. You just have to retain it. Mm-hmm. So he was right. Yeah. So you know what they say: sunshine's on a dog's behind every once in a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, so with this case, and also with the the AK pistol case, he eventually he won, right? But in he then turned around and for the first case, and I imagine that that'll happen here too, he then turned around and sued the police officers that arrested him for violating his rights. And the judge in, in the, the AK pistol case basically said, um, you can't walk around being suspicious or acting in a, in, a, in a suspicious manner on purpose in order to draw the attention of police and then sue the police because you drew the attention of the police. And the, the, con- the conclusion here in where where they uh, dismissed the charges, the the officers and the judge all said, you know, if he had just said, yes, I have the paperwork, they didn't even ha- he didn't have to show it to him. If he, they, if he had just said, yes, I have the paperwork, they would have let him go. So it says here, the defendant would be well advised for the safety of the public, the police, and himself to avoid situations like this in the future. The defendant can exercise his sec- Second Amendment rights without scaring or endangering the public and without being uncooperative with a le- legitimate law enforcement investigation. However, the court finds that the defendant did not commit an offense under that particular code. Uh, therefore, hereby ordered, adju- adjudged, and decreed that the motion to dismiss be granted in, and this case be dismissed. So it happened exactly like I said. As soon as he showed the, the judge the paperwork, which was in, in, entered into evidence, the charges got dropped. Ta-da! But he won. So uh, you can run around now with uh, with your suppressors and your SBRs and your SBSs uh, and... Um, you're not this this has basically been held up that it's a defense from prosecution note that it's not a defense from arrest <laughs> <laughs> and 13 months in the legal system that uh, you don't have to show the police your paperwork or even tell them that you've got it so congratulations Leonard yep we should put him right next to that uh, famous general Pyrrhus yes another such a victory and I will be ruined yep well, speaking of police and guns, Miguel wanted to talk to us about how police tend to get shot a lot in Venezuela. Miguel, I've got a question for you. Go for it, sir. Miguel, if guns are banned in uh, many Latin American countries and armed crime is still quite a bit higher than in the U.S., how do criminals get their guns? Oh, I'm very glad you ask. If you, you know, get in uh, touch with the United Nations uh, Office of Cr- uh, Drugs and Crime or the Small Arms Survey, which is a non-government uh, uh, organization from uh, Zurich, I think it is, uh, from Switzerland, uh, they'll tell you there is this big uh, iron pipe of guns coming from weapons, of weapons coming from the United States into other countries. Uh, unfortunately, that is a little bit of a of a lie. Well, wait a minute, Miguel. Aren't aren't uh, 
aren't the Mexicans kind of, the Mexican drug cartels coming into the United States and just buying their guns at uh, at gun stores? Well, yeah. But if you look at the uh, uh, the pictures of uh, the weapons uh, that the drug cartel has been uh, caught with, you're gonna find yeah, you're gonna find a lot of M4s and in carving version, short barrel short of uh, 16 inches, and with uh, uh, selector switches instead of safe switches. Wait, are you telling me that? That these guns that they're getting, they're weapons that are short-barreled rifles, which are not available to without a, a license in the United States, and they're machine guns, which are new ones, aren't available at all in the United States. So that means they're not coming from ordinary gun stores in the United States. Well, then where are they coming from? Usually, those guns are coming from what is the direct government-to-government sales that the Mexican government either you know does uh, for themselves or for uh, different. Uh, Police departments in Mexico, and somehow after they get there, the go the guns happen to go other places that they originally intended for. Uh, that is uh, normal. They either uh, some of the drug cartels will you know go and break into police stations and steal their guns, and this has even happened on security firms. They've gone in and stole their guns, or they're sold by corrupt officials. Uh, if you go farther south, you know, the farther away from uh, the United States, then it, it gets a little bit more difficult to apply the iron pipeline. Sure, there are always, you know, people that will try to make the people to come from the States and buy guns, but, you know, it, you're not talking about, you know, somebody, you know, who's going to pull over with a 40 foot container uh, up to Joe Bob's uh, gun shop and empty the whole place and go home and put them on, uh, uh, take, take them home with them. That's not the way it is. Anybody who's, you know, uh, bought a gun in the United States, no, that's not the way it happens. You know, the, what the, how they get the guns in, in South America, number one is going to be from uh, government sources. And what I mean to say is not that the government's got their own little secret stores and give it to the criminals, but you're going to have corrupt officials. I mean, a gun is something that people really, really want, especially criminals. So they'll, you know play uh, f uh, fast and loose with the inventory and guns end up falling in the hands of, of the criminals. Also, you know, they recycle guns that have been impounded in crimes before. And it's not unusual also to, you know, to have the same gun going into the its database and say, well, this gun was stolen before and recover and what is it doing back on the street? Again, when you have such a level of government control, it breeds corruption. It's it's easy for countries that are, you know, maybe not having the best economic situation for somebody to be influenced for money and get, you know, guns that are, you know, just simply thrown in, into a warehouse to go, you know, pick up a couple of guns and sell them on the street for a good price. Okay, so a lot of uh, government guns stolen or uh, misappropriated may be a good way to put it? Yep. If you're a big organization, we're talking about uh, guerrillas. Yeah, you got your Colombian guerrillas. There was uh, this article I saw that they were importing their guns from China. The government, the Colombian government, stopped an importation of a hundred uh, AK rifles. These are again full, appear to be uh, fully automatic. And um, I know that the uh, allegedly, you know, lately, uh, with uh, oh, you, you know, we are selling a lot of uh, guns to Mexico and AK 47s which didn't happen to be, but this word were kind of weird. It was easily made and identified they were not the ones we get. Is uh, Mostly what the uh, AK variants that we got here in the States, they came from the former satellite nations of the United States, the Soviet Union. Okay, the, the, from Poland, which were pretty decent, and the Romanians, that didn't have a good quality, but they were the, the, the best sellers. And they all had the, the laminated wood furniture. This one were solid wood furniture, very nicely finished, and they had, instead of the regular blade bayonet, they had the spike bayonet, which is kind of typical for the Chinese. Okay, so what we're seeing is, very clearly, they weren't the same sort of things that you would get at Joe Bob's gun store. No, you're not going to get it. The other, the, the other type of, of AKs that were coming in, and you see in the pictures, are you know, the, the new variants that come from the, uh, I think it's called the AK-104, that they start coming out in 2004, that come with the, the, the thermoplastics furniture. Mm -hmm. 
that is very hard to find in the United States unless you do it on your own. You go by the, the part. Okay, so those are being produced either in Russia or being produced in Venezuela. It's the only other country in Latin America that doesn't. Venezuela has a long history of smuggling uh, weapons to other to other countries uh, before you, they, or when the the uh, guerrilla groups like the FARC started. Their main weapon uh, of choice was the FN FAL. The Venezuela had the uh, uh, the license to produce, and they still think it still has them. Uh, now they all, they got the license uh, from uh, Russia to manufacture AKs, so that's what they're doing right now. And this is what they, oh, uh, <coughs> you know, all of a sudden they're appearing everywhere in Latin America. Also, you have one of the other things you see in the pictures is a lot of revolvers, and that is not something that this country pretty much has uh, torn off uh, revolvers in, in, in big scale. In the early 80s, when we started doing the translation to the to the uh, semi-automatics, Glocks and whatnot. So what you're saying is we're not seeing in in crime guns in Latin America a whole bunch of Colt pythons and a whole bunch of Smith and Wesson 649s. No, none of the good stuff. You're gonna have either the ver uh, you're gonna have find either uh, old uh, model tens, as we mentioned, uh, model tens that was you know the most used and abused gun in Latin American police forces. Mm -hmm. And uh, that then they officially never went into the civilian market because hey, there's no civilian market down there. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna have guns manufactured by Taurus and Rossi in Brazil. Oh, you know, I didn't think about that. Uh, Taurus is manufactured in Brazil, so you're saying that they're within Latin America, they're smuggling weapons. Uh, yes, uh, how they're doing exactly, I don't know how they're doing, but yeah, they're Rossi's, they're Taurus, and you also the other the semi automatics you, you still see a lot. Is uh, branding high powers? Oh, and they're totally not manufactured in the United States. Exactly, and they, but there's one country that manufactures them in Latin America, which is Argentina. Okay, so what we're seeing is we're seeing guns stolen from from impound or stolen from government stores or or misappropriated. We're mm -hmm. seeing smuggling from China or from Brazil or Argentina. Are there any other ways that people could get guns? Well, if you know, if you happen to be a poor criminal. And you know they don't have the connections to to you know contact somebody or don't have the money to buy a gun because obviously uh, black market is going to be extremely expensive on the price of guns. Mm -hmm. What you do is you rent a gun. You rent a gun. You rent a gun. You have, they have places to rent. You know criminals to rent guns. Obviously, if you don't return it in your life, <laughs> okay. But what you do is you go and go get a gun from somebody you know has them. And in Venezuela, it's the cops. So what you do is you go and kill a cop and steal their sidearm and their ammo. Well, how often does something like this happen? Unfortunately, very, very often. Uh, I think if we get numbers for 2012, and uh, for uh, the last one, we got an article here. It's for December 24, 2012, 101 police officers in the city of Caracas, the capital of the country, were murdered to steal their guns. We're not talking like all of Venezuela here. We're just talking the city of Caracas and they lost 101 police officers. 100 police officers just murder for their guns. And this was in 2012, you said? 2012. Well, I'm looking at the law enforcement officers killed or assaulted, which is part of the FBI uniform crime reports. In 2012, all of the United States, there were 48 police officers feloniously killed. That's a, in all ways, that's like deliberately run over by a car or shot or whatever. It's 48 in the entire United States. And now compare populations between the United States and Venezuela. Well, you know, that we're like 10 times as big. Uh, that's, you know, for the whole country. Now go for, for Caracas alone. You're talking about, you know, what, uh, four, almost five million versus 300 million? Well, like, you know, Wikipedia says Caracas has five million and 55. Mm -hmm thousand versus the united states which their most recent e estimate was something like 318 million people do the math i don't know I, I can't do that math in my head i'd have to pull out a calculator that's insane how do i mean how do they find anyone who wants to be a police officer in caracas i i really don't know man they have more uh well i guess you know they, they, they either it's an easy way to get money and well, that brings another kind of warmth that we'll, we can discuss another day uh, about uh, kidnappings, which are, most of them are police involved, and uh, but you know it, it is crazy. 
it, it is absolutely crazy. 101 police officers. I think this year so far we're running about 62. We just started in September. Like you say, how? Why would anybody want to be a police officer? But they, also, this is a, a cautionary tale. Is you know when the criminals are motivated and they need guns, they will find a way to get a gun. It also puts paid to that view that the United States is somehow uniquely violent in the world. All right, Miguel, thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a good one. Wow, I can't imagine a crime rate like that. Yeah, that's um, that's pretty amazing. And by the way, here's the math on that. Um, so I, I was doing some calculations. Uh, it's one police officer in Caracas, one police officer killed per 50,049 people. Uh, so if you extrapolate that, that would be like New York City having 168 police officers killed in 2012. Right, and remind me, what was the number of actual police officers nationwide that were killed that year? 48. In the United States? 48. 48. So, okay. so, um, so if, if all of 48 of those police officers had been killed in New York City, uh, Caracas's crime rate still would have been four times uh, what it was in, in New York City. Now, if we expand that nationally, it would be 6,354. If we had 6,000 plus police officers killed in the United States, we would have a police state. There would be lockdowns. There would be people like there'd be checkpoints everywhere. Yes, that is completely insane. But hey, you know, let's ban guns because that'll make everybody safer. Yeah, because nobody can get a gun if you can't buy one at the uh, gun store. As a legitimate, it's not like somebody will kill a police officer and take their guns. Ugh. Yeah. So fun with headlines. Well, let's have some fun after that very depressing thought. Yeah. What do you yeah. got that's funny? So, uh, so this one started off. Um, I read this on my local uh, news news site, and it turns out it went national and then international. Um, but the the title, the headline, you've probably heard this one was. Flight grounded after knee defender gadget leads to inevitable row. That was the thing that kind of like, wait, what? It, you, inevitable? Really? So if I you don't actually know. Look if at, somebody's blocking my chair, or somebody, you know, somebody's being that kind of a douche. I think it is kind of inevitable. I'm gonna get mad. So, so I used to fly a lot, and there's a lot of airlines that uh, completely disable the uh, reclining feature. Okay. okay? So. If, if I were to try to recline in a chair and it, it didn't work, it probably, I would probably just be like, oh, darn. So if you go and actually read the story, uh, and I actually had to pull this from the Huffington Post because my, my local news site, they changed the headline to make it a little bit more realistic. Um, but if you read the story, uh, the flight was grounded because the, um, the passenger in this story whose chair was being blocked assaulted the guy that was um, that was behind uh, behind them. So the guy that was using the knee defender got water thrown at him. Um, so it's more like uh, knee defender leads to assault. Well, so, to be honest, I I'm I'm not seeing the problem. <laughs> I mean, so you know, you, water. So just remember, cheesy. folks, if you use a knee defender and Sean is on the plane with you, you're going to get punched no, in the face. No, you are not going to get punched in the face. Sean does not <laughs> punch people in the face. Yeah, I'm honestly, if you're that kind of a jerk I, and you get wet, sounds like your problem to me. So Baron Barnett wants to tell us about some bad SD cards that he got from Amazon. Hmm. So, Baron, you're telling me that you just got a bad batch of micro SD storage cards from Amazon. Um, what's a micro SD card? So, a micro SD card is a small little piece of flash memory, like what you get for your cell phone. Uh, plugs into the backside. It's about the size of your pinky nail, and it's just for storing data. Oh, so you like the thing that I put in the camera so that I, you know, I can store my photos. Yep, use it in your camera. Uh, there's mp3 players that use it basically any device that stores information in one form or another probably has some form of sd card in it okay so kind of like a flash drive but it's just a card and rather than something that sticks in my usb that is correct bad ones i mean like is this just a manufacturing error in this case it's actually a counterfeit sd card 
The order I placed from Amazon was for two 64 gigabyte SD cards. The price should have been the clue that, you know, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. But it was on the borderline where it's actually kind of plausible. I said, okay, I'll go ahead and give it a shot. Two cards came in and I went to go copy something onto it. And I tried to validate the data after I did the copy and it was incorrect. So I then ran a utility called F3, basically did a deep analysis of the flash drive and discovered it's actually only about four and a half gigabytes. Everything you said went straight over my head, except for the 64 is actually four. I got that. That's, a, that's wrong. You, there's a utility out there you can use that will allow you to validate how big it actually is yes. and whether it's messed up. Yes. Uh, in Linux and Windows, there's a utility, or Linux and Mac OS, there's a utility called F3. And in Windows, it's in the show notes, it's called H2 Test W. And it allows you to, you just point it at the flash memory and say go. And it goes through and it basically writes a bunch of files to the SD card. And then it goes back afterwards and tries to read it. And when things don't match up, it realizes that it doesn't match up and it will actually calculate how big it actually is. So we're not talking like I've got a 16 megabyte or excuse me, 16 gigabyte flash drive that actually is only like 14.9 amount of storage. We're talking like this is actually messed up. Yes. This is what we refer to as a ghost run or a counterfeit chip. It was sold as a 64 gigabyte chip. It was manufactured using substandard material. And the end result is that there's a bunch of the flash memory that's actually bad. It just doesn't work. And what people figured out is there's ways you can fool the file system into treating that smaller space that is valid as being something much bigger than it actually is. So if you were using this in your camera and you were taking pictures with it, you just overwrite the pictures you previously took once you actually ran out of space. Wait a second. You're telling me that the camera wouldn't know any better. It would just say, oh, I've got 64 gigs and I'm just going to keep taking pictures and I have no pictures left? That is correct. Okay, now I want to go find out who made the thing and go choke them. It was probably some factory in China. Oh, that's going to be a bit of a hike. Yes. From looking at the SD card, they swiped some of the silk from SanDisk. And we're using that silk. There's a silk screen on the front of the SD card. That's where the you know the white printing that you see that says, "Oh, this is a 64 gigabyte SD card." It was manufactured by Kingston. They apply that by a silk screen. Oh, okay, I get that. Okay, now well, here's my question: They have the actual factory, right? Yes. And they're running it on the same factory that they're making the other ones on. Yes then why aren't they making ones that actually work? Do they just, like, not do it right? Uh, in this case, it's usually the result of somebody saying, hey, we're about to throw a bunch of defective material away. Let's go use the defective material and sell it to suckers. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, how do they think they're going to get away with it? Because for the most part, they do. Uh, no one really comes after them for it. I'm going to go ahead and return this SD card and demand a refund, but most people will just go... Oh, it's just not worth my time. Okay, so if you get something bad, demand your refund. I mean, Amazon will give you a refund. That's right. Who distributed it? The distributor in this case was, I think, Amazon listed it as cheap memory or something like that. But the next memory distributor up the chain, I don't know. There have been instances where distributors have actually delivered bad memory to major manufacturing houses. And... The end result was hauling the manufacturing or the distributor and the manufacturer, i.e. Kingston, and then saying, what the heck, guys, uh, this is a problem. Kingston finally said, OK, we'll take the bad batch back, even though it wasn't their memory. And they just tried to sweep it under the rug. It sounds to me like uh, maybe it's not such a good idea to be manufacturing your stuff in places where you can't actually control the manufacturing process. That is correct. All right, Baron, it was good to have you, and we'll talk to you again next week. All right, see you next week. Adam, you're a computer guy. That That is the rumor. I didn't even know this was possible. Oh, yeah, it's it's absolutely possible. Um, the, the funny thing is, you know, he talked about how they figured out the software that can trick the, the SD card into reporting to the operating system that it's got more storage space than it actually does. And then it actually, you know, will go and 
and start overriding stu- the oldest stuff first, that actually takes a lot of skill. Um, so if if they had like sold something like this, if they probably would have made more money than selling the the fake SD cards. Uh, let me tell you, if I came back off of my two week vacation overseas with four megs of pictures on my 32 gig chip, I would be will I'd be ready to murder somebody. So the <laughs> the problem is. So now you know about this, that this can happen, right? But uh-huh. before Baron talked to us about this, you know, you, you probably would have just been like, what 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 happened? And it just would have been a tragedy. And now you've got yeah. somebody to be mad at. Oh, yeah. Trust me. I would find one of those knee defenders. I'd put it in a sock and I would <laughs> beat somebody until they gave me the money to take that trip. With a again. slung shot. That's, yeah, that's well, right. That, in fact, that would be slung shot. <laughs> I love how we keep surfing yeah. back, man. This is pretty cool. It's like foreshadowing. Yeah. Reverse. We're going to do something different. The book report. I spend a lot of time in my car. I drive from place to place doing inspections for my job. And so I decided that I'm going to start listening to some books on tape. And this has been going on since November of last year when I got the new car that it was easy to plug a, a flash drive. <laughs> flash drives. <laughs> <laughs> All of my flash drives are pretty good. Um, I've been plugging flash drives in and listening to the music that I've been, uh, well, listening to the books on tape that I've been storing. So the most recent one that I listened to was 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Yeah, that's that's a classic, right? That's supposed to be pretty it's good. It's a classic. It sucks. Yeah. It absolutely <laughs> sucks. Like, now see, the worst part about that is I had just finished listening to, uh, just previous to that was Jane Austen. And Jane Austen is a good writer, and and the stuff that she writes about is fairly interesting if you're an adult. I I can't imagine trying to read that as a teenage boy in in high school. Here, read this Jane Austen (sighs) novel. I'd gouge my eyes out. But I found it interesting, and I'm a big sucker for um, costume dramas. I I watch uh, Downton Abbey. Um, I'll watch a Jane Austen novel, or Jane Austen movie. Um, I'll watch a Jane Austen movie, even the ones with, uh, who's that? Gwyneth Paltrow. So I'll even watch that. So when when I told my wife that I was going to be doing a, a podcast with you, and she like was like, "Wait, who is that? Is that the guy with no pants?" I said, "No, no, no, that's the guy that watched da- watches Downton Abbey." She's like, "Oh, oh, that oh, guy." Well, okay. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm a big big fan of costume dramas, but still, you know, you listen to that whole thing. Before I listened to the um, to the Jane Austen, I listened to Anna Karenina. And Anna Karenina, let's face it, Anna Karenina is a soap opera Russian style. I mean, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, holy crap, we need to get this, do this whole show and shoot it in the, uh, in the uh, Mexican soap opera style, (laughs) the telenovela style, because it was like, it would totally fit. It's like telenovela (laughs) with a Russian accent, man. Oh, man. Well, I'm like, okay, I need something to clear you know, I, I need something interesting. I need something exciting. I need something science fictiony, something that is as far away from a costume drama or a historical uh, romance thing as possible. So I'm like, I got this twenty thousand leagues under sea. I'm gonna listen to that. Oh my goodness! How do you get all of the classic elements of a great adventure novel and still suck? And this this thing had they had a hollowed out volcano in this book. The the original. I don't know. I think it may have been the original hollowed out volcano. The original evil lair. Right. It wasn't quite an evil lair. It was a oh, secret okay. base for the submarine. The submarine well, sailed in through a tunnel and like it was inside a hollowed out volcano. Just like Airwolf. sucked. Oh. Oh my goodness. Um, I was talking to Weird about this and he said that he had just read the book and he says, you know, it's kind of like somebody sat down and, and wrote a Discovery Channel program. You know, look at all these things that I saw. Huh. And I think, no, that's not really true. What's ha- What happened was is somebody went nuts in Paris. <laughs> like completely Could've crazy. Happened. Could've, Could've happened. happened. Yeah. And what he did is he went to the aquarium and he wrote down all the scientific names. Because if you ever read this, it's like uh, there's this scientific name animal and this scientific name fish and this scientific name fish. And it's in this location and it's next to this island, which is this many square uh, you know, acres and this many that and this tallest point is this. And literally, it's like somebody's reference book with all the scientific names written down with sort of a plot attached. 
It was awful. So it, it's like the, I think the whole book is like an attempt to tell a story of a visit to aquarium by a person who's gone insane. <laughs> so totally wow. skip this book. Uh, way ahead of you. <laughs> you skipped it. You skipped it without even having to be told. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to sit down and rewrite that because there's so many elements there. You could just totally make an awesome story about this. If you give Captain Nemo some reason for doing what he's doing beyond he's being a whiny you know what about the fact that his wife and child got killed. And so so he's running around in his very expensive, very, really amazing, can go down to the bottom of, of seas that are so deep that we still can't visit them, you know, submarine. And with glass sides, you could go down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench and open up the glass windows and, and you know, look. Oh, that would be and, awesome. Yeah, and, and, and he's, you know, sinking other ships because his wife and his child died. I, I, I just huh. want to slap him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of weird... Uh, Weird's got some, uh, well, he's got some special, special people. And this week in Anti-Gun Nuttery. All right, Weird, I hesitate to ask, but what kind of Anti-Gun Nuttery have you found for me this week? Oh, I've got a gem for you, Sean. All right, so here I'm going off of Jason Kilgore, a.k.a. Balder Odinson of Ceasefire, Oregon. Can I just say that if Odin had a son like Jason Kilgore, he would have squashed him like a bug. Or impaled him. No, I don't think he would have. I th- he'd have squashed him. He wouldn't have gone to the trouble of impaling him. And what is what has Baldar Jason done this time? So he posted up an image of uh, some open carry activists in a Target. And you've got uh, two nice ladies with uh, in the picture with uh, AR rifles slung across their back, uh, checking out uh, in various points at, uh, in the Target. Minding their own business, doing their doing their thing, and Jason, oh yeah, yeah. I see the picture now. That the one on the right has some really nice hair. Yeah, no, they're 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 pretty girls. Now here's now here's the thing that really really amused me, is Jason says it's not a political thing. I do not feel safe. I will not return, and that's that. And I gotta say that makes me wonder, because so he's got some ladies carrying some AR rifles. I will note that it's pretty easy to tell, even from this grainy picture that I've got provided on my blog, that the guns are not loaded. Jason is well aware. He's always searching for various instances of people doing horrible things with guns, and he runs the Walmart shooting blog, which we may have to talk about at some point in a future episode, and all that. He'd be the first to know if one of these open carry you know, events turned into something dangerous, either somebody getting up in somebody's grill, or there a fight breaking out, or someone shooting somebody else, or even just a negligent discharge. And Right, right. Let's be honest here. The only things that are really going on at open carry rifle open carry rallies beyond the, you know, the carrying at people, you know, the idiots that are that are that are holding their guns at low ready is some really serious fashion crime sometime. So uh, and then another thing to think about is that uh, Jason comes from Oregon, hence the ceasefire Oregon. And uh, that's a, a pretty good state to conceal carry in. You know, you're it's a it's a it's a shall issue state, and there's uh, there's no statewide preemption. So pretty much, just like most states, if you if you can legally buy a gun, you can legally get your concealed carry permit. And they've got no assault weapons ban or anything like that. So I think it's safe to assume that Jason is frequently encountering people armed with firearms in his day to day. And uh, and then you know on you know on top of that the the guns are unloaded. So what exactly is he scared of? If it's you know completely not political, Sean. Well, I think we probably should talk about what is really going on here. He's like basically every other gun anti-gun person. He's trying to pretend that he doesn't understand why people are carrying rifles in any given store in in Texas. They keep ignoring the fact that what the people in Texas are doing is carrying rifles because they're not allowed to open carry handguns. Yep, unless you have a black powder revolver, which, you know, some people do, some people don't. What they're really trying to do, and futilely in my mind, is trying to change the culture, and in this case change it back to what they think it was, where people hated guns, people were afraid of guns. I keep telling people, if you open carry, you are not going to educate the public 
You are not going to raise awareness in the public, but you are going to raise your own awareness. What you're going to find out very quickly is that most people don't care. Most people don't care if you have a gun. The majority of the people that you end up talking to are going to be like, hey, cool, here, here, you, you, I'd show you mine, but I, I got it concealed, or I've got mine at home. And you end up in the conversation of, well, why don't you carry it? Yeah, that is a big problem. We got a lot of people with carry permits that uh, don't feel like using it. All right, so what's ended up happening is, is they're trying to reimpose this view that if you have a gun, you need to hide. And the open carriers, and I've open carried, I open carried in Pennsylvania a lot. I don't open carry much down here in, in North Carolina, but in Pennsylvania I did all the time. And it was consciously adopting the, we're here, we have guns, get over it. And people like Baldar apparently don't want to get over it. Well, they, what they don't want is they don't want people recognizing that, uh, oh, these people are carrying and, you know, I may feel a little apprehensive about the fact that they're carrying, but uh, in the end, I'm being a little foolish because, let's face it, they're not doing any harm, they're not doing anything wrong, and they're really not that big of a problem. Kind of like the, the you use the we're here sort of situation, it's kind of like the gay movement is... There's a lot of people that were uncomfortable about, you know, two gentlemen or two ladies holding hands and sort of thing. And we go, I'm pretty uncomfortable about that until you suddenly realize, eh, not really a lot to be uncomfortable about. Yeah, pretty much. I think that the real issue for them is not so much that they think the rest of the country is going to, I mean, unless they're really stupid, the rest of the country is going to suddenly say, oh, yeah, let's all start open carrying. What they really want is to reimpose that silence that we put on ourselves. Uh, you were... You tell us all about how you used to be anti-gun, but for those of us who grew up with guns, especially like me, I grew up in Los Angeles with guns, it was not something you talked about. You weren't public. You didn't go tell everybody you had guns. You didn't tell anybody that, oh, you know, I go shoot on the weekends because it was in your mind, you you believed that it was socially unacceptable. So you shut up. You never told anybody. And you never passed it on. All these other people who had guns that didn't talk about it, they thought they were all alone. Well, the minute you start open carrying, you find out you're not all alone. A lot of people are just like you. They just haven't open carried, but they've got a gun and they like yours. Yep. And was, I mean, the same thing. Back when I was anti-gun, I just assumed anyone that carried a gun with them that didn't have, you know, some some of the, you know, the progressive prescribed reasons like, oh, you own a business and you're carrying your cash register till to the bank at the end of the night or you live in a bad neighborhood or you, you know, whatever you know, you were paranoid. You were just, you were just a nut. You were just, you know, someone that was just jumping at shadows and scared of things. And, oh, it turns out, nope, not true at all. In the end, it appears to be more shut up, they explained. Well, there's that, but there's also a little bit more of a sinister angle is that also a lot of these instances of people, go, you know, rallying against the open carry movement is there's been a new push on the I haven't heard that many cases of it actually happening, though I'm sure it is, um, is they're saying, well, you know what? If you see anybody open carrying, call 911. And even if you're not scared, make a good scene of it. You know, you know, really go, well, I don't know what they're doing. They might be threatening people. I'm, I'm not really sure. I'm a little bit scared. I, I'm concerned about this person. And the that the sinister angle of it is, is they want cops to to roll in weapons hot to stop people who are doing absolutely nothing wrong it is not against the law to open carry whether you like it or not that is currently the law and so long as you do it in certain prescribed methods it is 100 percent kosher 100 percent legal the cops can't do anything about it unless of course they think that something violent's about to go on and that's i think what some of these people want is they want the the good guys to get shot yep they're the same sort of people that would be standing out of, outside a stone wall and calling the cops saying there's gay people in this bar go raid them mm -hmm. i got nothing for the guy he looks like a cult member to me yeah yeah the, the, the all the all the all white apparel that he wears when he dons the the balder odinson persona is uh yeah it's a little odd mm -hmm. yeah a little odd that describes him all right weird Seems like you've brought another case of anti-gun people who are arguing once again in bad faith. It's sort of a theme, isn't it? Yeah, I read those anti-gun blogs so you don't have to. All right, weird. Thanks a lot. See you next week. Yep. Talk to you later. Oh, yet another one of those gifts that keeps on giving, eh, Adam? Yeah, I'm glad that weird reads those people so I don't have to. I would, it would drive me insane. 
I get the feeling that uh, people like Baldar, if I identified myself to him, would turn and run screaming. He's just afraid of everything. Didn't Shannon Watts kind of do something like that at at a rally? Like yeah, the guy. she like tried to make the cross about tried to make the sign of the cross uh, uh, at uh, Dana Lash and sicked her bodyguards on her. Yeah, well, I think she did that to somebody at like AWC too or something. No, that was a guy who uh, who uh, stood next to her and got his picture taken with her while he was concealed carrying. Yes, yes, yes. But, I but she he didn't for a gun company. Yeah, I think he did. Yeah, he was a. Uh, um, trying to think of who he was, but yeah. Speaking of things that grind my gears, low flow toilets. Oh man, I, I hate low flow toilets. I can totally sympathize with you. Right, but see, it's worse than just I don't like low flow toilets. I think low flow toilets are a plot against marriage. Do you know that? No. Please expound. <laughs> okay, in a strong marriage. When everything's going pretty well, I and mean, nothing's perfect, you know, you're married, you know these things. In a strong marriage, the little things, they don't burden your marriage to the point where it breaks. But when you've got those marginal, you're on the edge, you've already got enough stress, you don't have enough money, you maybe have kid problems, you maybe have, you know, employment problems, you don't need that extra stress. And when you, when you flush the toilet, you expect it to work. You're a man. I'm a man. We expect that engineers who, who design toilets, they design them so they work, right? Right. It's not our job to second guess a dude with a slide rule and a green eye shade. Right. He knows what They're he's professionals. doing. professionals. Right. I shouldn't have to hold his hand while he does his job. Well, it used to be, I think it's something like six gallons per flush. It seems like a lot of water, but they calculated it. It'll take six gallons of water to take the turd and move it out of the bowl into a safe location, right? Right. Now it's 1.6 gallons per flush. You know why 1.6 gallons? Why? Because that's six liters. Oh, that's cute. Because apparently turds are metric. Ah, that's what the problem is. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what the original flush was. Maybe it was like 2.3 gallons or something like that. But it's now down to 1.6 gallons because that's six liters. So the people who decided this is how many gallons of water you need to move human bodily waste from point a to point b not point a were french uh, well i know they were they were overridden <laughs> by a bunch of bunch of people who signed a law oh yes right? yes so you and i being men not wanting to question the engineers and not really wanting to waste that much time in our lives trying to figure out what's going on down there once i've dropped the lid and because i've been trained the lid goes down and i flush so it's no longer my problem right and it doesn't flush yeah well, it does flush, but it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. Right? And I'm not going to look. It's not like I'm like, oh, let's watch it go because I got better things to do. Flush, boom, I'm out. I'm going somewhere. I got things to do. And then three hours later, why didn't you flush? <laughs> what do you mean, why didn't I flush? I flushed. But you didn't. Clearly, you didn't because it's here. Marriage doesn't need that kind of stress. You know, no. I got a strong marriage. That's not really going to get into it. You know, it's not going to get me into the into the bad zone far enough that it's going to be a problem for me. But how many people out there, they just don't need that extra stress in their life? That that could be the last straw. It could be the last straw. So yeah, low flow toilets. I think they're a plot against marriage. Yeah. So uh, so we bought a, a house last year. It's thirty something years old, and so all the toilets need to be replaced because well, some of them don't work. And then they're all like, I think it's called doe skin colored. So it's like they're, they're beige, but it's like a dark beige. Uh huh. Yeah. So they're, they're absolutely hideous. So the first one that we replaced, we got one of those ones that actually has two buttons on it. It doesn't have a handle. It has two buttons. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen those. Button labeled one and a button labeled two. Yeah. Yeah, For obvious reasons. Yeah. So, um, the, the, the one is like, it's like 0.4 gallons. Uh-huh. And then the two is like 1.2. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I first saw yeah. them when I was in the Navy was in Israel. Hmm. The desert country. Yeah. That, that, that makes is, sense. Yeah. We we don't live in the desert. I don't certainly don't live in a desert. Yeah. So I almost, you know, uncle is a, uh, the guy who runs, say uncle, he is a contractor. And I almost called him and said, hey, where can I get some like black market high flow toilets? 
<laughs> oh yeah i tell you what i can make a mint get a bunch of 100 watt light bulbs some high flow toilets some high flow shower heads and um dish soap that still has phosphorus in it oh gosh Ooh. yeah i can make a mint so there actually is an easy way to make those uh low flow shower heads be high flow and we can cover yeah, that later a drill yeah yeah a pair <laughs> of pliers <It> worked <laughs> All right, Adam. What grinds your gears this week? So, so mine this week is um, people who don't don't get off their cell phones when they're in line for fast food. So, and it used to be, you know, ten years ago or even five years ago, uh, that people would be, you know, talking on their cell phones, and then the person, you know, they go to order and they'd be like, "Oh, uh, hang on a second, I'm still on the phone. Let me, you know, let me get off the phone." It's like, okay, it's you know. It's 11:45. There's you know 20 people behind you uh, in line, and you know everybody's got an hour for lunch. It took them 15 minutes to get here. You know, hurry up, chop chop. Well, right. now it wasn't really a secret that you were in the line and you were coming right. towards the front. Right. And now it's you know it's people that are um, uh, you know looking at Twitter or Facebook or whatever, and they like you know they'll bump into you or you know they'll they'll drop their phone and kick it across the floor because I don't even know what they're doing, but um, yeah, if you're there to eat and order food and there's like 20 people behind you, pay attention to what you're doing. I mean, that's just common sense. That's a common courtesy. Yeah, I think you're right on that. All right, well, that's our show for this week. We'd like to thank Rob Allen for our music and thank you for listening to the Gunblog Variety Cast. As always, constructive criticism can be sent to Sean at SeanSorrentino.com and send all your hate mail to wizardpc at gunscarstech.com. Show notes for this episode can be found at gunblogvarietycast.com forward slash episode three. Thank you.